getting like Stone Cold with a few bears. Play the game, I end the game. I'm champion and I'm Triple H. Undertaker, I'm your maker. Bury the brother like Kane. Ooh, one three, hit the tombstone, hit the choke slam on face. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, like a macho hill, tell like a muscle. If you suck with lots of muscles, I'ma keep a couple muddles. Ooh, and you may call me HBK. When I'm tuning up the fame, you best be getting in my way. Ooh, yeah, I'm the generator. I love it, yes, I love it. If you wait, down with that, then I got two words for you. Suck it. Welcome everyone to your longest running Australian wrestling podcast, Wrestle Radio Australia. I'm your host, Todd Eastman. Good to be here with you this week. I hope you went out this past weekend, or if you couldn't go out and see Australian professional wrestling, you stayed home and watched. Just happy to be here on the Fight app, of course, uh, the PWA Academy show. Really good youngsters coming up in the Academy, of course. Um, Joey Farrow, I really enjoyed. I thought he had a lot of future to him. A um, couple of guys who weren't actual like Academy rookies but but we're on that show was back pain i really did enjoy that tag team i think they've got a, a great future if if they're just looked after right and um yeah really did really thought they had a, a, a good chemistry a good look to them and I, I hope to see more of those guys in the future um one of my wrestle sons xander sullivan had a match against um my guest from last week ricky south uh it was good he did he he did all right you know you can't can't really help yourself when you're up against the number one contender to the PWA title. And of course, remember that PWA title is being defended on March the 12th. Um, start out with a kiss, of course, get around it on the fight app for PWA. Um, my guest this week, I'm going to get straight into that and go to views from East and all of that sort of thing. There's going to be a sort of a, a quicker intro this week because I really want to get into the chat with, um, with my guest this week. He is a legend of South Australian wrestling uh, havoc. And when I, before I even knew wrestling in Australia, before I even knew, well, when I first knew of wrestling in South Australia, because I grew, grew up in South Australia, the only two names I knew in South Australian wrestling when wrestling in Australia were Jag and Havoc. And um, this guy's been going around for a good on 22, 21 years now. And just great to, to sit down with him and pick his brain about the, where where he started and how he came up. And and you'll find out some, like I found some stuff out on this interview tonight that I hadn't known and, and really made me thought about, or made me think about where Australian wrestling or, or at least South Australian wrestling would, would have been if, if Jag and Havoc hadn't have, have started the way they did. So yeah, really good chat for him and really good chat with him. And I, I, I can't wait for you to see it. So we're going to get right in that right after this view from the East, right here on Wrestle Radio Australia. This week's views from the east is sort of like um i don't know if you call it a mental health check or, or what you call it but it's sort of something like um I'll, I'll be straight up this 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 last week or so i've been a little bit down because um yeah your facebook memories sort of things pop up and this week's this one of the ones that popped up this week was it has been a year to the day of the last australian uh wrestling league show and it would, that marks a year now since I've, I've been working behind the scenes, booking or helping produce um, a show in Australian wrestling. And, and, and just the special things that came from that show, because if you watch it, it's, on, it's up on YouTube. If you just check it out, uh, mm -hmm. Interphase 1, I think it's called, um, Australian Wrestling League. Uh, it's the show where, where AC Diamond won the, the AWL Championship and... Um, EC Diamond for me was at the time anyway, was the guy who who was a future in not only Queensland wrestling, I, I believe he had a future, he has a future in Australian wrestling. And it was just, it's one of those things where it made um, what we do, like as bookers, as 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 promoters, as as people behind the scenes in wrestling, 
it was one of those things that make what we do worth it when you see a young guy uh elevate the way the way that that the diamond has over the last few years and, and especially on that show where, where he was given the title and <clears throat> we were pretty much pretty much said to him this is like this is your shot now here's the ball run with it and it's just something that that it's something i love and i think it's the, the thing i love most about what i do in wrestling is is helping produce young talent helping these guys uh, achieve their potential and um it's something i really do miss to be perfectly honest with you and it just got me thinking about the whole things about missing everything and i, I just don't i don't feel like us in the business realize just how very lucky we are to be doing what we're doing i don't i, I don't mean i just don't mean wrestlers i mean ring announcers i mean referees i mean um commentators camera guys everybody who is involved in this crazy little world photographers um shout out to barb she listens every week and watches every week shout out to barb does a great great job out of the kindness of a heart rocking up to shows and taking photographs and making the guys look as good as she can i don't think we all realize how lucky we are to have all those people around us and that we're so lucky to be able to do what we do every month week fortnight anytime we walk through that curtain anytime we we get a chance to actually walk out in front of a crowd that is paid to see us perform and i i, I just think i don't think that that young guys understand so much like just so how so amazing that is that the people pay people go and work or, or budget their money once a week or once a fortnight or once a month to pay to come and see us do what we do and as, as much as we're out there like putting ourselves out there and all of that sort of stuff it is a huge thing to know that that, that some people are paying 15 20 bucks a piece to come out to see us do what we love doing and, and to see us perform and to see us uh, give our art to to them whether they boo us whether they cheer us whether they get on the internet and complain about something we've done during the show the fact of the matter is that they've cared enough to come out and pay their money to see the show or they've cared enough to, to after they've done that about the product to talk about the product and whether it's a, a compliment or a, a criticism preferably constructive but either or it's amazing that we get to do this and it's amazing that we get to be a part of something so just so amazing i can't i know it doesn't sound like it sounds like i don't know the words but it's just it's unbelievable we get to do this and um i think that gets lost on a lot of guys so now i know for me a lot of times i took what i was doing behind the scenes for granted that i was the like thinking up storylines and booking talent and and thinking of things going forward because i always had the idea that the, the mind was always set on the next show the next month the next where we're going with this where we're going with that and oftentimes i never really took the time to to sit back and look during a show and go look what we've done look 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 what we've created look look at the atmosphere we've made for these people so what i'm saying to you for, for the people that are in the business the working week in week out putting on a show just take a moment take a minute take 10 seconds during a show look around and just be grateful just be thankful for what we get to do every week because i know from now on that's what i'll be doing instead of just constantly thinking about the next match the next opponent the next angle the next storyline the next everything i'll be thinking about what we're in now what we're doing now and just being grateful for being there anyway that is it for this very sentimental views from the east i'm todd eastman that's my opinion and you're all entitled to it. And we'll be back with Havoc after this. Ladies and gentlemen, history has been made here at Reanimated 16, the 15th anniversary of Riot City Wrestling. And what better way to cap off a memorable double header of an evening than walking away with this bronze beauty. That's right. After what could be called a, a, a triumph 
uh, of the wheels. Uh, uh, my life is, has just come into one. Oi! Hey man, I was just about to talk about uh, how well you did. I've told you a thousand times. Yeah. Right? You're here to sign contracts, yeah. work out the politics behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I can win those matches on my own. Yep, you sure can. Right? You won this Go, one. Going the wrong way about it doesn't get you respect. Wrong way? This looks very bright to me. Very. Just do what you're told. Okay. Alright? Alright, alright, cool. Let's go, man. Come back here, that's my key. Havoc, thank you so much for joining me tonight, mate. Oh, thank you. Great to come on. Um, now, normally, like I usually hate asking these, this, the, the whole, where, how did you get into wrestling? Where did you get training? But your career now has been like twenty some odd years, so your story will be a hell of a lot different to what most guys that are going around the traps now are. So, so how did you break into professional wrestling? Because it would have been a hell of a lot different than what it is nowadays. Yeah. So this was late nineties. Um, Hartley Jackson, good friend of mine. So we were mucking around in the backyard with friends on mattresses. This is, you know, when people were just getting into putting websites up on geo cities and, <laughs> and all that sort of thing, you know, where you'd put up a six second clip and it would take, you know, half an hour to download it and watch it. Um, so we had a, um, a backyard wrestling website up back then. And uh, a lady named Robin saw it, who knew a retired wrestler called Ivani. Uh, I think she wanted to get into promoting. She'd always been into wrestling. Um, Cole saw what we were doing and just basically said, hey, look, I'll, I'll start training you if you like. Um, you know, he still had plenty of contacts from his days back in the, the 70s and all that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, eventually he, he got us along to this gym that had, uh, I think it was a wrestling ring that had been converted into a kickboxing ring. They took the chocks out or whatever so it would bounce again. Um, and then, yeah, we trained for a good year. And then uh, Robin started up Pro Wrestling South Australia and uh, had the first show, I think it was October 4th, 1999. Um, Hartley Jackson and myself had our first match against each other. Uh, wasn't a lot going on in the scene. I don't think there was much happening in South Australia at all, to be honest. I think maybe a Melbourne group would come over now and then. Um, and we did actually go see, see one of those shows and have a chat to some people there. Um, but we didn't really know anything about what else was happening on the Australian scene back then? I mean, the internet was, well, wouldn't say in its infancy, but, you know, there was, people weren't just putting up all websites about their businesses and yeah, stuff. Yeah, people were still um, tape trading. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I can remember that. Like, tr we'd trade tapes of our matches to s see what people were doing in Melbourne and that sort of thing. Yeah. I, um, um, interestingly enough, I used to work, I worked in a video store in um, Morphavale, Movie Lane Morphavale. Mm. And um, we used to have, I can't even remember what their, name, who the, what their names were, but a family would come in and always rent WWF videos. But one of them mm. would always go to the shows, the local shows, and take a bloody camcorder with them. And so, oh, if, yeah, and every now and then I'd get, they'd just give me, a, like if I gave them a free rental, they'd give me a tape to take home and watch. Oh, so nice. like, what shows I, were they? Off the top of my head, I could not tell you, but um, I think... Real Deal Steve O'Neill was in it. Um, yeah. Uh, Blue, oh, what's his last Blue Blood? Name? Blue Blood. Blue Blood. Yeah. This is back in the day, day sort of thing. Yeah. They're I'm the guessing two this would be early 2000s, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. But before yeah. then, like, like the only names I'd even heard of in, like, it, that if there was South Australian wrestling, was Jag and Havoc. They were the two names yeah. that sort of was always, that was always bandied about. But yeah, it was just um. Yeah, so you, you guys still remember first... those days when I had a name. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you guys were the were the first two of the Monster Factory. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, I think Luke Hazard came with us as well. Like he does a bit of commentating and stuff yep. now. Yep. Um. You know, there's some other guys. It's from those early days, I'm not sure there's too many people still around. But you know, within the next few few years after that, there's plenty of guys like. Uh, Tyler Daniels was in that early lot. Um, Blase, who's now doing his um, Power Slam shows at his, his new gym that he started up. Um, obviously, uh, Johnny Raddick, who you know went on to do, um, he ended up sort of taking over that Pro Wrestling South Australia name. So there's still plenty of those guys around involved in wrestling. Um, but I suppose 
not that I'm trying to take the credit for it, but that that backyard wrestling that we put up and Jag and myself chatting to Cole, I guess that's kind of how the modern era of, of professional wrestling in South Australia all sort of started back up again. Yeah, because that was like Monster Factory is also like Slater, um, Maddie yeah. McCree, all of those guys yeah, came I'm, from that. I'm trying to, you know, my memory's not great, but you know, <laughs> within those next five years is where people sort of came in and out and and then uh, you know, I guess over the next decade or whatever is where, you know, people started having different ideas, people would offshoot, start their own groups, all that sort of thing. And now you have this diversity in South Australia with I don't know, anywhere up to six different groups putting on shows here and there. Mm. And um, I'm guessing training was a hell of a lot different to what it, what it is sort of now too. Yeah, I mean, if I, you know, do the occasional training or something where I'm instructing anyone with anything, I, I still like all that old school training. I still like people starting their bumps on the mats. Mm. And, um, you know, I still love the old line up in the ring and everyone, you know, all right, everyone do clotheslines and everyone gives each other a clothesline. You know, you work with different people and yeah, and all that. So I still, I still like that sort of stuff. That's the, the way I was trained. Um, you know, I, I didn't go overseas to uh, dojos in the US and Japan and all that sort of thing, and, you know, pick up all that funky new wrestling that, <laughs> that everyone does now. Um, tried to to sort of fit into it as best as I can. But yeah, like I still like that old school training, but it, yeah, it's very different now. Yeah. Well, I even remember back when I started training and Maddie, Maddie would be running the training sessions and we'd be doing back bumps on the black mats. It was the same thing. Mm-hmm. This is where we started. We barely even had this when Cole was teaching mm-hmm. us how to bump. I'm <laughs> like, all right, fair enough. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm a little bit jealous of, uh, of the like younger guys in wrestling now, just, you know, when we started, there was no connections. You know, no. you, you didn't you didn't have anyone like, oh, talk to so and so in the US. You know, they'll they'll find you something if you go over there. There was there was none of that back then. Yeah. Also, uh, so uh, a lot of that got built. Yeah, well, because of the internet too, the world's a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't it wasn't like it is now. But like I said, you know, <laughs> making your own crummy little little website that you'd get two views on because you know not that many people were, were doing that back. What were um what were the crowds like in those first? Because it would have been around the the Attitude Era time or just after. So was was there big yeah. crowds coming out to those shows, or was it just sort of yeah? Like there a- was. Or I'm pretty from memory that first PWSA show in 1999, which was my first match. I, I reckon the Octagon Theatre, which has been knocked down now, was a great venue. It had nice big stage, ring in the middle, floor seating, and also had like raised seating at the back and everything great then you i'm pretty sure they pretty much sold it out and that was the first sort of big show that had that'd been there for a long time and you know even over the the next few years i remember we'd uh, very rare would you ever not have a crowd where you're like ah oh, that looks great out there you know yeah. just um I, I, I don't know you know um it's obviously been a while since we've had any sort of big shows i mean we had the rcw show at the fringe on the weekend which was 450 sold out in there but you know, generally, if you're putting on a big show at a good venue, it's it's very rare that they didn't have nice big crowds in them. And that's, you know, ever since we started back then. Mm. I remember because every now and then you get a story out of Matt Rock. Mm. And it was always like, oh, yeah, we wrestled here and there was like 700 people. Like, what the hell? <laughs> what do you mean? Just, oh, it was just yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So actually, I, I did meet him early on. So... I said how there was like a Melbourne group would come over now and then. Um, this was before we started training with Cole. So we we had a chat to the guys. I think it was, was it Mean Gene Gatto who used to come over. Big Mo, big curly hair. And they put us on to Mad Max Miller, who I think was training Matt Rock and yeah, uh, a guy called Brian. Yeah, so we, we went along to their uh, training sessions. It was just on mats and that a couple of times. But we went back a couple more times and they weren't there. I think like they'd gone off wrestling and we thought they'd gone and they thought we just didn't come back. And so that just <laughs> kind of petered out. But that was like our first little introduction to wrestling where we first went breakfalls and that sort of thing. And then because we thought, oh, that was a dead end, we sort of took that back to the backyard with us <laughs> as much as you can hone it with no one correcting you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we did have that little bit of experience before Colvin picked us up and, and took us under his wing from there. 
Yeah, I always, always have a theory that Matt Rot is just an eternal character we didn't know about. Because there's always like mm. a story, brings out a story about it. What year was that? I mean, how long have you been doing this? Oh, it could be a little bit. Yeah. It's never, never an actual yeah. story about when he started or how long he'd been working for. <laughs> it's been so long he can't remember. No, wow. Well. <laughs> well, he had yeah. so many sort of different characters too. Because wasn't yeah. he like a, a dirt bike character or something for a while? Or Well, I... I remember the AC, I think, I think the group from Melbourne was called ACW and I remember um, Jag and I there watching it and, and we sort of worked out. So he was, he was Matt Rock, the punk character um, with like the spiky hair earrings and I don't know if he had a skateboard or something, I'm probably just imagining that. But then <laughs> he was also a ninja or something, like a full like gi and oh. ninja mask <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And like, so he'd go from like his sort of, more ground style or whatever he was doing in the punk character and then he was doing moon salts and stuff in the um in the ninja character mm, that, that was one that was one guy that anytime i had training and he was there if you could get in the ring with him for like a couple of minutes that was just for me that was a dream because i'm like this mm. is how the guy is so good and so smooth i'm like how i know you've been doing it for a, a million years but how are you not like everywhere do you know what i mean he's yeah. just so good yeah, and everything. Looks yeah, so I, I'm crisp not and... sure if I, I'm not sure if I ever managed to get in the ring with him or not. Not as the rude ones, or no, no, because I, I, it's only the last couple of years that I've I've um, wrestled in RCW. So, oh, yeah, that's true. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not. I can't recall if I've act, ever actually got in the ring with him or not. <laughs> well, there you go. That's a considering how long both of you have been around like you've been around 20 yeah. years and he's been around yeah. since eternity so it's like well to be honest the when jag and i first started i don't know why but we basically wrestled each other exclusively for probably the first 12 months i think just because when we started people weren't doing power bombs gym and suplexes all that sort of stuff we were and i think we just kept getting put together because we were doing you know jag was doing like the Scott Steiner style Frankensteiners jump up, catch you straight under, you know, which people weren't really doing back then. Mm. So we just kind of just got paired together no matter where we went. But also he's changed his his look and his size so much oh, yeah. from, from when he debuted. I used to, to be the big one back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's huge now. Yeah. So um when when you guys sort of got further into it, did you find mm. did you find that sort of you you sort of stayed more with the the European style of wrestling and he moved off into the, the Japanese style or were you interested in the Japanese style as well? Uh, I mean, I've always liked little bits and pieces of everything. I mean, you I know, mean, obviously can't speak for Jag. I don't know exactly everything he did, but he obviously went and spent a lot of time in Japan uh, and the U S and that, and I suppose he's, he's picked up a lot of that and it's something that he enjoys. Um, I've always kind of liked a little bit of everything. So generally, more brawly power moves you know as i went on i'd stick in like a top rope runner or a cartwheel into something as, as i've gotten older you know that that strong style stuff has really sort of come into australian wrestling which wasn't there early on so you take on a bit of that um whereas yeah it was something he had a lot more experience with um i just like picking little bits and pieces mm. mixing and, it all together and because you would have you've started with, with Cole, how much did he actually let you in on what went on, like psychology wise and all of that sort of thing into a match? Or was it, was um, it pretty much just like teaching you the moves and then like, oh, now, now go and learn sort of thing? Well, what, one thing early on was Cole was like, I'll teach the basics, get your falls down, you know, things like your headlock takedowns, all that sort of stuff. We've been doing backyard wrestling so long and, you know, we sort of picked up our break falls and stuff. Um, and we, I suppose we were doing modern moves that he wasn't used to. He said, your moves like that are fine. I don't need to teach you how to do a suplex or a slam. You know, he'd, he'd tidy up your arm positioning and that sort of thing. But, you know, things like power bombs and that weren't his forte. He, he saw what we were doing with Chris. He'd help us tidy him up and that. But it was more about the more about the, the technical side. You know, if, if you didn't want to get super technical, he didn't say, well, you need to know how to do every single move. Um, but yeah, he, he just sort of give you the, the, the basics, make sure all your fundamentals were sound so you wouldn't hurt anyone. Um, and then he sort of let everyone develop their own style. He, he'd give you suggestions, he'd, he'd tidy you up on things that were sloppy, but he didn't 
sort of force anyone down a particular path, which was good. I get, I, I guess he wanted to make sure everyone knew the fundamentals well, but he knew wrestling had changed, it moved in a new direction, and he, he sort of just let that come into it, which was really good. Mm. And then with psychology, did he sort of like sit you down going, oh. like, this is how it... Well, Cole comes more, he, he was more from, Cole, Cole's not with us anymore, no. of course, so, but you know, he's, he's uh, left a huge legacy here. But um, he came from that catch as catch can style. So I think the wrestling he was in, a, a, a lot less of it was, the, was really psychology. It was more like, you know, if you're better, you beat them sort of thing. <laughs> it, um, I think the psychology side of it came more, because uh, I can tell you the matches Jack and I had early on <laughs> had no psychology. It was how many <laughs> moves can we fit in? Um, oh, so but, it's AEW. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I think as, as everyone started to study wrestling more and people, you know, uh, after those, you know, within that first five years, people started to, you know, going into state and stuff started to happen more. I mean, I used to, Jag and I get on the eight hour bus trip to, <laughs> to Melbourne, get off the bus, go straight to the venue, get our gear on, work at our match, wrestle, stay the night, get up at 6 a.m., get on that, that eight hour, or I think it was 12 hours during the day, 12 hour bus back. But, you know, once once the if people started gelling and, and meshing and people from other states came together, what people were doing in other, other states sort of started to rub off onto other people. And, you know, there were, from what I recall and what I saw, there wasn't a lot of psychology early on mm. in Australian wrestling back then. And, and yeah, Cole, Cole was more of that bit more shoot style on that. So, he didn't have he didn't sort of push on us the same psychology that you would now no and um like pwsa became epw adelaide was it, or was it? so you had pro wrestling south australia and then jag um i think started epw adelaide here and and i went off with him to that i think that pro wrestling south australia i think before that and again um Oh, my memory's not fantastic. Yeah. It's been 20, 22 years now. Um, I think PWSA became Maximum Power Wrestling. This was just like different people would take over in that. Yep. And then Maximum Power Wrestling became Joint Promotions, which I think Cole sort of took over, not because he wanted to, but because, you know, other people wanted to move on and he didn't want wrestling to sort of die out again. So, you know, again, he put all his time and effort into that. And then... Yeah, and then EPW Adelaide was like a shoot off from that. And then I think what was left of Pro Wrestling South Australia might have gone off to form Snake Pit, I think, which Johnny was involved in. Then that became Pro Wrestling South Australia again. Mm -hmm. And then over the years with the different alliances and connections and that, EPW Adelaide became, I think it was zero one one for a while when there was like a sort of a connection there. And then, you know, the, the last however many years it's been Wrestle Rampage which is where until the last couple of years when I've sort of branched out more was where I spent the majority of my time. Mm. So were you involved in the whole, the EPW thing going to Perth or was that just a, a jag? Oh, like how they got started up over Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, again, I, like I won't sort of speak for them. I'm going off my best recollection. Yeah. So I don't, think they had, I don't think they had anyone to train them over there and but they loved wrestling and wanted to get involved. There was a bit of, back then you had like that, uh wwf down under message board or whatever it yeah. was um it was wrestling and, you know, net or something. Copying, yeah yeah i think they were copying a lot of flack because they didn't have training and that sort of thing not that they had anyone there to train them um i think from what i remember jag and i were kind of like well you know maybe these guys should be given a go and a, a bunch of them came over and did like a can't remember how many weeks it was, but like every single day for weeks they were here, here learning from Cole, training everything, and then they took that all back with them to Perth. Like it was, they were here a long time doing a lot of training. Um, from my memory, that's you know they took that back with them, and then well, look what they've turned into now. Yeah, yeah. E e yeah. EPWs, you know, that's some of my fondest memories is going over there and wrestling. Yeah, because you would have, yeah, I suppose being, being the connection too would have been an easy thing to say. I'd like to come over and work or they, they, we want you yeah. to come over and help us. Yeah. Like, I still remember when they were sort of making their name over there and that Jag and I went over for a big tag match against uh, Dave Storm and Jimmy Payne. And 
you know, by today's Australian wrestling standards, it's probably nothing special. But back then, it just felt like this this step up in a match compared to what we'd done before. It's to, you know, just memories wise, it's still one of my favourite matches. That tag match. Mm. So I was I was gonna say, um, because you've been around for so long, that sort of stuff really would have stuck out to you, like the um, you did the one at the. Uh, the power, I want to call it the, the powerhouse because that's all I remember it as. Oh, titanium um, security. Did, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Changes yeah. his name every five minutes, but yeah. What, yeah, how, that was how, a thousand people, I think. Something like, because I remember I was, yeah. the one show we worked, that, that Cree and I worked for Wrestle Rampage was, I believe, the show that you guys, that Rampage announced that they were doing the, doing the, the event because Jag yeah. like pulled us, we were talking to Jag and he goes, Oh, between us, we're announcing this tonight. And we're like, oh shit. So how how was that working in front of those guys? Because that would have been you would have been yeah. working your normal like big crowds for, for rampage, which is usually what two to three hundred. Then to, to yeah. lift it up yeah. to like to a thousand must have been amazing, especially with oh, and the yeah, card yeah. that they it had for that fantastic. too. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a great big show. I know um we'd had a like we'd had experience with a couple of shows like that before um Andy Raymond did those couple of Australian wrestling super shows which were I think that was even more at Penrith Panthers or wherever they did it so we, we'd had that bit of experience before but um no to, to have that at home in South Australia um mm. yeah that was a huge show that was um you know just one of those shows you'll always think back on and oh look what I got to do yeah you know, someone else might not think it was much but you know, to me, that was, that's just one of those awesome highlights. Yeah. Well, you've done something on an almost regular basis that, that I was one of my wrestling dreams to do that I never got to do. And that is work seven in theater. So is that still, mm. a, is that still going around in Adelaide? Has that been torn down? Cause I know last time no, I, was in Adelaide, so I think they... it's, I think it's heritage listed. Like it's still there. They still oh, have good. various performances and that sort of thing there, but there's something special about that venue. Like, you know, I don't know when it was built, but it's it's got that nice big stage. It's got those, you know, sort of ornate little um, balconies up the side. You've yeah. got the the massive roll of seats that goes all the way up the back. Um, plus, then you've got floor sp- uh, floor seats in the ring, and and just in there, yeah, that's that's probably one of my favourite venues I've ever yeah. been. I think I've wrestled there two or three times, and I remember when I was a kid, I went there when they had those. Wrestle what are those shows. shows they were? I was, yeah, we're, we're like that was Jake the Snake. Yes. And, um, I think, Jim the Anvil. I think Liger came for one for, of them. Yeah, it was Liger and, Liger and Benoit, I think. Yeah, I reckon it was. Yeah, actually, I reckon it was. Yeah. And then, then you had like Smash, uh, yes. Max Moon. Um, See, because you Hawk. and I, you and I are roughly around the same age. So that was, that was the show I was at as well. And that was yeah. pretty much the reason why I was like, this is one place that if I ever get into wrestling, I would love to work just because mm. of that, the attachment I had to it. Cause that's where I saw junkyard dog yep. live. I saw smash. I saw mm. like the Malenko brothers before I even knew who Dean Malenko was the yeah. Malenko brothers wrestled the yeah, fantastic. Right. They, they were in there, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, and I remember, yeah. cause I think oh, I was great venue. I think I was 15 or 16 during that time. So yep. it was sort of like, and yeah, my friend, fun. my best mate who I went to it with, had gotten back from America not long before because he'd spent like six months there with his family. And he was just like, mm. you need to check out this kid, Chris Benoit. He's going to be amazing. And also Liger is just unbelievable. I'm like, oh, fair enough. And did, both of them just blew me away. But Dean Malenko yeah. stood out. And then when I saw him pop up at WCW, like, oh, I remember that guy. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, it was I mean, those sort of shows have died off over the years, you know, like... Um, Obviously, WWE comes and tours now and then. But, uh, yeah, those sort of little shows where they come over to Australia and put it on, yeah, less and less. But they, they were, yeah, they were, I suppose, I'm, I'm just glad I got to experience those because if I hadn't been in that live atmosphere with, you know, big names and, and all that sort of thing that I knew, mm. would I have got into wrestling like I did? Like, to have that experience was something special. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing that the sort of, like, it... It amazes me, but and also makes me depressed of the fact that I saw that when I was fifteen or sixteen. I never chased it up until much later. Mm. Like I didn't even really know there was local wrestling that much. And then when it was, it was out because I lived in Morphavale. It was always like Paraka or 
that like yeah. Port Adelaide, that yeah, sort always, of town. It was always just, out there, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm not traveling all that way just for that. That's all yeah. that. I wish now that I'd have done it and maybe gotten into it a lot earlier than what I did. Cause like, I'm only, yeah. I'm only what, 10 years into it now. So I just think of all the yeah. times that I, I, I sort of probably could have like had that I didn't just yeah. because I, I didn't bother chasing it up. Even yeah. though I was hardcore into it, like I was a tape trader, I was any little bit of wrestling I could get my hands onto, I would get and watch and consume and all of that sort of thing. Mm. It just, I just couldn't believe that I never knew there was a local product until 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a little bit, so I think back on that, like, you know, I wish I'd branched, branched out like I have the last couple of years earlier. You know, sometimes I think it would have been nice to sort of go to Japan and the US, but, you know, you had the things of, oh, I've got a, um, you know, a job and a mortgage and all that sort of thing. It's too hard. I mean, you know, you can always use that as an excuse to yourself. You've also got the, ah, oh, I'm not good enough to go over there anyway. Why not? Whereas, you know, now you're going, oh, I wish I'd just taken that chance. But yeah, like I'm trying to do now, just make the best of, of you know, what you've got around you now, I suppose. And, and that's the thing too, because for a long time, wrestling in Adelaide was very like tribal. It was like you worked for this mm. company and that was the only company you worked for. Or you moved to another company yep. and then that was the only company you worked for. And then that was yeah. it. Cause I was like, I, like you the same. I, I started at Wright city wrestling. I thought, well, this is the only place I'll ever work. Cause I'm living in Adelaide. This, yep. is, this is it. This is all I'm going to work. And I was quite happy cause I love, love everyone in RC dub. But it was just like um, when I moved up here and I saw everybody works for everyone, I'm like, well, this is so much fun. Why wasn't I doing this years ago? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the things that, you know, some things stay the same, other things have changed here, but there, there is a lot more of people working together here now, which is great. Um, I sort of wish I'd done it earlier, but, um, you know, you, you sort of have a group of people you're happy with and you kind of feel loyal to them and, you just sort of hang around. I suppose I I got to that point where I felt, mm, I don't know how much longer I've got to do this for. Um, you know, you start to think back and go, oh, what, what have I sort of missed out on? Um, mm. I, you know, obviously got all my long-term niggling injuries and stuff. And, you know, there was a period there where I was in really bad shape. I'm probably in better shape than I've been in a decade or more. Now I feel good in the ring and I was like, oh, just kind of need to make the most of the time I've got left. So, you know, had a chat around of, yeah, the last couple of years now I've had, had a, a lot of fun wrestling at all sorts of different places because, you know, while I feel good today, I still wake up every day and go, oh, my back's killing. I should just <laughs> give up now. You know, who, who knows when I'm finally going to get to that day where um, that is the case where it's like, uh, no, I can't do this anymore. So no, it's been great the last couple of years to, to sort of expand and enjoy doing that all over it was also too because at, at rampage you were like for, for your almost heritage listed there that that was yeah you were like synonymous with with rampage it was like like i said before yeah jag havoc jonah these guys were all just like this is what you thought of when you thought of was wrestle rampage because i remember when i got the message from one of the guys that, that you were coming over to work for um right city i was just going holy shit well wow, just a like a one-off deal like we did with with back in the day like no no he's coming to work shows i'm like holy shit that's awesome it's because it brings mm. to you especially for you it brings to you all these fresh matchups that you wouldn't have seen or wouldn't have had yeah. for like so you've got like maddie you've got cree you've got um zach you've got all of these guys that you never really had a chance to work now it's a whole new thing yeah. like the match you had against brooksy which just got rave reviews around the country from people that had seen it yeah, it's it, it's been so good. Like it's, I suppose, doing that and having all these fresh people, and you know, everyone wrestles differently, and you know, things are done differently at different places. I, um, it's sort of revitalised me, I guess you'd say. Like what, while I'd gotten in better shape and I was feeling better in the ring anyway, it's it's just, you know, if if I hadn't have done that, I maybe I would have been done by now. It's, it's just been such a huge difference to go out. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many people there I still haven't wrestled. I mean, I yeah. just had a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Zach recently. Um, I've only done a little bit with Matt Hayter in Rumble. Um, Brooksy, who, who knows if I ever would have had that opportunity anywhere else. Mm. Um, 
yeah, it's just, you know, it kind of feels, you know, it feels like I've been taken back and I'm, you know, just sort of in the first third of my career again. And, yeah. um, you know, like I've been doing it over 20 years and I'm like, oh, wow, what am I going to do with this guy? Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's it's been fantastic. I'm, I'm so glad I did it. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, it's got to be amazing for you. It's got to be almost like, and especially too, because as much as you, your name is synonymous with South Australian wrestling, my, from my experience anyway, Rampage fans and Riot City fans are, are very different. Like a lot of them don't even know that those other, like yeah. the other, because I remember we walked out, like Cree and I walked out for our match against Slater at, at Rampage and somebody just leaned across the, the, the thing and just leaned out straight in Cree's face and goes, I don't even know who the fuck you are. I'm just going, oof. Because I knew I knew I was getting yeah. thrown thrown out early in that match. I put my hand on his shoulder. I went, "Well, have fun with this, mate. This is gonna be great." <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, I think it's you're getting a lot of crossover now, especially because you've got you got PWSA that doing shows, ACW, Riot City. You got Rampage. Um, you, you've got those Power Slam shows now, but there's um, I, I am seeing groups of people who are sort of at various ones. Um. A bit like back in the day, like my old, well, I guess you'd call it a persona, my old <laughs> grumpy man in ring persona. Like I'm now, I'm starting to see like this, this group of people who, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm heel or whatever, there'll be this group of people like, yeah, smash them in the face, have it. And I'll go, and I recognize those from the other <laughs> show that was at the other week. So like, there's, there's people who, I suppose there's a good chunk of people now who are sort of watching it all. They're lucky for them they get to see all these different matchups all the time which is great um but you know from, from what i feel from being out there you have also got your people who just go to this show and hmm. just go to that show hmm. but it's yeah. good you've got different crowds to work as well yeah in in saying that do you um do you find it hard now because you've been around so long to get heat because fans sort of like have a begrudging love for you even though you're a heel. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I know yeah. I've, I've, I've got it as well, right near the end of my run yeah. in Riot City. It doesn't matter what bad stuff we did. There was a core crowd that hated us, but there were some guys yeah. that just didn't matter what we did, just loved yeah. us. Yeah, it just it just depends where I am. Like, I'm the first one to say I got the charisma of a potato. Like, I don't, <laughs> you know, I'm not someone like Matt Hader who just like scratches his face and people cheer or someone like, um, rocky who just like points at someone and everyone goes off at him like i i've always been a very much like i just beat people up and i let that do the talking for me sort of guy um and then you know you do it the right way against the right people the crowd will hate you for it or you know you do it the opposite way they'll cheer for you but w one thing i've noticed is this last couple of years wrestling all over the place and i've also wrestled far more often than i had i mean i think up to april this year, I've you know, there's plenty of days where I'm like wrestling one day and wrestling the next. Now, for other guys around the country, that might mean nothing. But when you're 41 <laughs> and you haven't really done that for a long time, it's yeah, it's it's a lot. But the plus side of that is in the last couple of years, my crowd interaction and that just from being out there so much has increased a lot. Now, again, other people will probably watch those matches and go gee, he's crap at that. But for me, <laughs> it's just being out there so much more, you know, I just feel like I know what I'm doing in there and I've been able to concentrate on those other things which have never been a big part of me, which is like that crowd interaction and stuff. So now I I can go and be like, well, I need to get these people to hate me, so I'll do this and whatever. You know, it's... it's um, I, I Like I said, I've still got like some people who I guess just have seen me around so much or whatever, they'll cheer for me no matter what I'm doing. Yeah. But it's good that I'm getting to that point now where I can, you know, if it's like, well, I need to do something to get this crowd to hate me. I'll, you know, now I can make it happen, which is, <laughs> is good to finally be able to do. Well, even like back, back in the day, your character was very like you were, you were quiet, but you were very intimidating. Like to the point where it has probably taken me this long to message you to come on the show because I was just like, I'm not mm. sure if that's just what he's like all the time <laughs> i don't, so, don't know if he's a grumpy dude all the way this, this is something i've worried about with 
I mean, I, I haven't done a lot of wrestling interstate for a long time, but I used to do it a lot in the past. And I am generally a fairly quiet sort of person. If I don't know someone very well, I, I, I'm not the sort of person who feels comfortable going up. Hey, mate, how you going? Nice to meet you. Like, I just, I've never been comfortable with that. And so I have, <laughs> you know, I'll sort of sit there like this going, oh, I hope someone comes up and says hello. Mm. And so I do worry that over all the years, I've put all these people offside who have gone, gee, that grumpy bastard wouldn't even come and say hello to me. What an asshole. But really, it's me going, oh, gee, I don't know that guy. Hopefully, he comes and says, says hello to me. Like, so I'm, I'm I am 100%. generally a quiet person. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not surprised you felt that way. Yeah, well, I'm like, to be honest, I'm 100% the same. Unless I know people, I find it really hard to just... Like, like you, you asked me when we, when we first got in contact, we're like, have I met you, met you before? I'm like, I think we yeah, shook hands. Yeah. I think we shook hands at a rampage because yeah. literally it would have been me just hard oh, nice to meet you like and walk off. Cause it's like, yeah. and the yeah. way I was raised in, in wrestling by, by Maddie and Cray is like, you shake hands, you say hi, and then you move on. Don't, don't annoy people. Don't like you speak mm. when you're spoken to you, you know, and that's just the way I've always been. Yeah. Yeah, so while while I'm fairly quiet and the people who are very boisterous and stuff, I can only take them for so long. The people who are really, you know, more sort of um, what would you call it? Um, Laid back. Uh, you know, like yeah, yeah, and more like, happy to talk to people and all that sort of thing. When they come up to me and say hello, I'm like, oh, thank God they came up and said hello. Now <laughs> I don't have to awkwardly go up to them. So, so you know, anyone who ever anyone who ever bumps into me if uh if you're thinking i'm just an angry bastard and i'm telling you to piss off that's not it at all come up and say hello and then i'll feel good about it <laughs> yeah no because yeah like i said i'm 100 percent. if i'm in a locker room that i don't know anyone i'll go around i'll say my, my hellos and then i'll just mm. stick with like the people i know because i don't want to yeah. i i don't want to annoy people that may be trying to work something out or work out their match or something like that and just be, it was just the way I was raised. And I don't know if it's like half of that makes a bad impression on them people because it's just like, well, look at that snob. Yeah. doesn't want to go and talk to anyone. Well, it's, yeah, it's yeah. And that's, that's what people probably think of me, but uh, what can you do? <laughs> well, oh, that, yeah. Go up and say hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that, that requires doing that. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I find it quite hard. <laughs> um, you're, you're also someone that like I, I can identify with a little bit too because... You're one of the rare people around the country that actually works with a manager. And mm -hmm. um, because like, that's what I do. So it's sort of like, ah, this yep. guy knows. How, um, how hard did you find it when you first started to sort of work Ben into your act or work Ben into your, to your gimmick and find, because well, a lot of guys don't know how to use managers. Uh, yeah. And there'll, there'll be some where like you just do do what do the thing at the start, then you just watch the match. Don't worry about it. Then yeah. there are other people that will work that actually use us as an extra tool. Like Cree, yeah. Cree's, Cree was amazing for it. Um, Jake Nova, who I work with up here, is amazing for it as well. Then there's been other guys that I've worked with that have basically just been just stand outside and like, ah, cool, whatever you want. Yeah. No, Ben and I have known each other a long time and he's uh, he's a very smart guy. He's like a, a writer. He's, he's written like award-winning comics and all sorts of things. So he's he's got a great mind. Sometimes you have to reel him back in a little bit because he's like, I've got all these ideas. And you're like, whoa, whoa. Like, you know, that's the crowd's not going to understand what's going on. You need to treat the crowd like they weren't here last time and, you know, make it easy for them to understand. But so he's got lots of great ideas. He plays the snarky asshole very well. Um, as I said, like my while well, my crowd interactions got better, it's uh, gotten better. It's never been a strong point for me. So to have someone out there, I mean, I've I've had probably most of my career without a manager. I've had had a manager at other times, um, but yeah, when I started at, at RCW, um, he he came along as well, and you know we sort of got paired together. And I was like, well, good because he can actually, you know, while I get used to this crowd and stuff, he's great to work with because. You know, people look at him and hate him straight away. So that's <laughs> sort of looks to him. He's got to face you on a wipe off. Um, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, he, he wants to make sure he does a great job out there and he has done a great job. And um, I, I like to, to 
get him into matches where I can, you know, even simple things like a, a trip over here, a choke behind the, when the ref's not looking. I mean, obviously that the crowd hate him for it, but that, that helps me the, you know, any heat we're trying to get out there, you know, some of that will rub off onto me. So mm. thank you very much. I'll take some of that. Um, it's also, you know, you, there's no point having a manager and then going, well, you know, just stand over there and, and do what I want. You know, this is all about me, but everyone who's out there is a part of that show and can contribute to it. And, you know, obviously the more people who contribute, the you know, the more the crowd get out of it. They're, they're seeing something different because I'm, I'm not sure if there's anyone else uh, RCW comes out with a manager. Be Jim, uh, well, whoever uh, Jimmy C works with. Oh, yeah, Jim, yeah Jim, Jimmy's sort of transitioning between things at the moment. But, um, yeah, he was before, but he was the very, you know, like hypey, facey mm. stuff. Like we had that great story, myself and, and uh, Ben against Steve Miller and Jimmy C, which ended in that that tag match of me and Ben against Jimmy and Steve. That, that's one of my favourite stories I've ever had in the last 20 years. I, I love love that. And the managers, it wouldn't have been the same without them there. Yeah. I remember telling when, um, when Jimmy yeah. first when Jimmy first started, every time I saw a clip of him, he was taking offense. And I had mm. like I messaged him as it stop getting hit. No, oh, but it, it's real cool. It's fun out there. So, I know it's fun. It's great doing it every time you do it, the fans are just getting used to you getting hit. Mm. So if you save it up and like they only hit you maybe once or twice a year, you'll realize you don't have to do much to get that, that reaction. Cause that's yeah. what I do. I've got like yeah. a two, two to three bump a year card. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But Ben's been very much the same. I mean, he, he would do whatever anyone thought the show needed of him. He, he mm. would quite happily do it, but he knows the less, that anyone actually gets to do anything to him, the more it will mean when it happens. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, so right. no, it's it's been great working with him out there. I've loved it. Yeah, that, that that's that's exactly the like. The more you can tease that they're going to get you, and they don't like Cree was great because Cree's the one who taught me all that sort of stuff, and it was sort of like because mm. I was pretty much probably would have been like Jimmy at the start. Oh, then he's going to hit me. No, he's not going to. The guy will grab and then I'll cut him off. Cause that gets mm. the crowd, the crowd will hate me for cutting him off and they'll hate that you didn't get hit. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. that makes sense. But a lot of, and a lot of guys too, like if you've got a smart manager, like, like Ben does, uh, like Ben is. And uh, I like to think like I am, I, I remember talking about it with Jake when Jake, the, their music was hit and Jake's like, oh, do you want to go through the curtain first? I went, no, you're the star. You, you go first. I'm yep. accompanying the, I, like, I think I said to him, said, you know, when he says accompany to the ring by, yes, it's not, you're not accompanying me, mate. I'm following you. So you're yep. the star. This is the way it's going to be. And I don't think a yeah, lot we, of people don't realize that, that that's, even if it's like subconsciously, I'm putting, I'm, I'm trying to put it out there that he's the one, look at him. Don't look at me. Only yep. look at me when I want you to look at me. Yeah, now Ben's very much the same. I mean, we've, we've got a good story going at the moment. I won the key to the city, which um, gives me a title shot at some stage. And while we, you know, we came in both heels in that over the past oh, however many months, we've sort of been transitioning where, you know, I, I actually wanted the, the crowd to appreciate me winning on my own, whereas he's still like, well, we should just do whatever it, it takes to win. And so, you know, now we're kind of, having disagreements and arguments which is just you know it's a new dynamic for that so we're having fun with that as well so you know he's coming out with my key to the city and like when i win i'm kind of like well time for that key and he'd be like yeah great and run off with it and stuff you know it, it, you just you know you can have those little dynamics that if you're out there on your own i mean if you've got a lot of charisma and that you don't need someone with you but it's just it's just nice for something different on a show to you know I've I've, I've you know we'll we'll be bickering and I'll and I'll be like now I've told you stay out of this match I can win it on my own and you'll hear someone go oh they're having problems like someone in the crowd <laughs> yeah. and you're like uh -huh, good yeah like, it's just it, it's just really fun it's, it's fun for something different to have the match throughout it and also like like you mentioned before you you, you just got the the key to the city that's got to be a a great sort of like confidence boost for you. That, that rights are you doing? Because for people at home that don't know, key to the city is like your money in the bank. So anytime they want, they can cash it in. So basically like you, you're in line to be like, you know, eventually main eventing. And so that's got to be like just a great boost for you to be 20, 20 odd years along and have a company still go, 
we want you to 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 do you're doing great work in the ring and then we want you to to like represent us in main events yeah no it's it it's an honor really and i um look either i've done okay out there or they're like ah oh, this poor old man he's he's right <laughs> near the end of his career let's give him a little something before he you know he kicks the bucket i'm happy with either it's, it's fine <laughs> with me i'm having fun out there uh but no it's yeah that that's been fantastic to 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 you know win win the key to the sea which you know puts you in the spotlight that's just you know for someone who i'll quite happily say i'm you know i'm in like the twilight of my career I've, you know it's not going to be years left on the clock so yeah to get that is yeah it it, it feels great that they're they were willing to do that with me and for someone in the twilight of the career how happy were you to know that you're going to be put into a ladder match for it <laughs> oh see I've, always, <laughs> I've actually always enjoyed those sorts of matches because um i'm not trying to keep up you know marathon matches with kids running over the ring it's like get hit with something it hurts a lot but people don't complain at you for lying there in horrible pain like you know it's it's the pain of getting hit in the head with a ladder or the the horrible pain of trying to keep up with someone who's half your age spreading around the ring non-stop so i i've always loved hardcore matches and when when you're working speaking about like the young kids when you're working with like the younger guys i don't know if you've worked with like a kid condo or anything like that is it sort of yeah, he was my very first match in rcw actually. Oh, okay. I, it's you know it, as obviously there, there was a specialness around it of my first match there but i just had a great match with him and really enjoyed it yeah i was gonna say is it a thing where you're like all right kid slow down <laughs> this is what we're yeah gonna do. i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure just about everyone there has, has heard me you're gonna have to slow it down a little for me <laughs> um i i try my best to be able to take all of the like modern moves and that everyone does like on the weekend Brooks gave me a Canadian destroyer which awesome I'm, I'm glad I can do that and make someone look good um I obviously don't do any anything too crazy myself I mean I don't I don't really need it for the sort of character I am or anything like that but I do pride myself on being able to try and make other people look good even if I can't keep up with maybe the type of match they would be would be their preference or uh, I like to think that I can you know I can adjust with my opponent to still put on a good match that gets to make them look good mm. but yeah they would have all heard me say to slow it down a little yeah well oftentimes too like especially the younger guys in the business they sort of like they want to get through everything quickly where maybe you're that yeah. smarter guy where like just if you slow down this is going to tell a better story yeah. and you'll realize at the end of it that this is what like i know that that's i was i was there while brooksy was pretty much learned that if you know what i mean mm. and was like and i then i saw him starting to teach it to other young guys and for me like being, being ringside it was fascinating to watch him like to watch it go off in his head and just go yeah oh okay now just hang on they do they're both but they've been there for a double down and i can hear him and they're going not yet not yet now <laughs> so <laughs> oh i mean I, I, I'd, I'd love to have that sort of just knowledge of exactly what's going on like he has like you know there's a reason he's one of the best this country's ever produced um i suppose even though i've been there for over 20 years there's been so many people who've probably wrestled half as long as me and had more matches than me so i don't wrestle any of these young guys and go i know it all kid i'll teach you how it's done every single person i've been in there with and especially those last couple of years wrestling newer people in that i've picked up something new or learned something or you know something's clicked that before that maybe hadn't um mm. so even though i've been around a long time even some of the guys have only been around a little while you know you still pick something up and learn something new from everyone you wrestle so that's i guess that's another thing about why i felt so good about the last couple of years is it's you know it's a whole new learning experience yeah, well, that's and that's that's the thing about wrestling that I don't think a lot of people, either at home or even that get start getting into it, realize that that you never stop learning, you never stop mm. like picking things up, you never like when you don't start hitting shows and that's it, you don't have to train anymore. You should be training all the time because you'll always pick up something, something new from somebody. Yeah, yeah well, but speaking about slowing it down, there's there's all those sorts of little things you start to pick up that. You know, like I know when Jag and I first started, it was just a big move, big move, Rana, powerbomb, 
you know, whatever, talk to the outside, get in, do another power bomb. And then you learn about slowing it down and less is more. And because we didn't really, in the early days, we didn't really have a lot of people telling us that sort of psychology. You just, the more you wrestled, the more you started to learn. Like, you know, I think the first place you kind of I'd pick, pick, ever picked it up, because we, we started having hardcore matches early, was, oh, how come by the, like, fifth bin, bin lid shot to the head, people kind of weren't making a reaction anymore? <laughs> and then, you know, you start to go, oh, you can actually do something a little bit too much, which, you know, then carries across to your big moves and that too. If you're doing too many of them, you know, by the time you get to the end of the match, people are like, oh, I've already seen 20 of these. So, you know, that, and that even even things like when you're using your your movements and emotions to to try and tell something to people in the crowd. I, I was just saying this at Rampage the other night when I was chatting to some of the guys down there. Um, I always say, like, you, you need to exaggerate your movements as well. Um, I still get annoyed at myself when I'll, I'll watch something back. Like, say I was going to point at the crowd and say, like, I'm going to, you know, beat this guy up or whatever, and you use your movements to sort of expand mm. it and get them more on board with it. And I'll go, ah, yes, I know I did nice, big, exaggerated movements. They would have really got it. And then I'll watch it back. And, like, the movements I thought I did were, like, yeah. a third <laughs> of what I did. And I'm like, oh, come on. I thought that, you know, even little things like that, where you, you're still looking at little bits like that, going, oh, you know, I should know better by now. Why is it, what, you know, and not more little things to improve on where, you know, slow it down, less is more, make things easy to understand and exaggerate them. They're, they're all things that... I guess you, you just continue to get better with. Yeah. One thing I, I, I was talking to one of the guys about, it, I can't remember what it was, where, who it was the other day, but it was just like with every falsy, like right near an end of the match, he was always there like, I'm like, why by the third one are you shocked he keeps kicking out? Wouldn't you get, <laughs> why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you just get mad and sort of like, that's when you, up the speed of your offense you, you like you get frustrated so like if this was real and he kicked out you would you wouldn't just be shocked you turn around and start punching him really fast because like yeah would you just stay down right gun? why i don't know why yeah. you do that it's like well because i saw it on tv i said yes but not three times in a row like that like after the third mm. time the guy gets mad like if it's a, yeah. like i always equate like if this was real and that happened you would get mad you wouldn't be shocked You'd be mad. So, like, show yeah. the crowd that you want to win this by being mad. Yeah. yeah and it's it's like, uh, you know, earlier on when you'd have moves and stuff you wanted to hit, you know, even now I make the mistake sometimes that you, you sort of do things that wouldn't naturally come to the match just because you want something to go a certain way. And then afterwards you're like, that was stupid. Or, you know, it didn't make sense. There could have been a better way to do that. Um but, you know, you, you get something in your head, you think it's good. It's not until you do it and watch it back that you're like, no, that didn't work at all. Yeah. <laughs> or even like um, knowing, like if you, you hear a crowd and you know it's sort of time to go home, even though you've got a lot of stuff mm. planned, knowing that, knowing to say, no, no, this is the point now. Because if you, if you go past this certain point, they're just going to die off on us. So let's just yeah. take it home now. I, I think a lot of guys miss that because, oh, well, I wanted to get this big high spot in as well. It's not going to matter if they don't give a shit by the time that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, if, if a chunk gets cut out um, and you, you finish off the match well and the crowd loves it, who cares? Yeah. You're there to entertain. And they don't know that you had all that planned. No. No, all they did was go, oh, that was cool. And yeah. feel like they've got their money's worth, which is what you want. Yeah, that's that's what I always say to, to the guys. Like, if they miss something, don't go back to do it again. Just move on. They didn't know that you had this idea, and maybe it just looked like you tried something and the guy blocked it. If you go back to it, yep. it just looks like, oh, hang on, let's go back and try that again. That that's when yep. you, you you can literally hear a crowd go. Mm. <laughs> that's the worst sound you can ever hear. Yeah. Uh, um, oh no no there's a worse one the boring chant <laughs> well yeah <laughs> true unless yeah. you're a heel and you're actually going for it i can't remember <laughs> yeah. i, I yeah. think it was dane dane did that once on i think it was like a supernova or something somebody chanted boring so he like put the guy in a chin lock and just held it for five minutes nice. just, just looking at him <laughs> i'm sitting there because i think i was managing him as bad i was dressed up like bane i'm managing and i had to cover my mouth because i was laughing as you can see, it's just like, I'm not going anywhere. You can chant boring yeah. all day. I don't care, guys. Uh, hey, if you can make it work, then it's fine. 
so so you you're doing this sort of thing like you like you said it's sort of like the the i don't want to say the end of but but nearing towards the end of the career mm. so you, you wanted to get all this stuff done are there guys that, that you really want to work like like certain people that you're like i want to work this guy at least before i'm gone or before i'm before i'm gone before i retire <laughs> well i mean I've, I've pretty much had the opportunity to wrestle everyone within rampage so so that's obviously ticked off which mm -hmm. is great um rcw i always wanted to wrestle zach sabbath which i got to do recently um brooksy i honestly never would have thought to have that opportunity at all and um that was such a good you match. Know, it, I mean, it, it was, it was, I mean, I, I'm just glad I managed to keep up with him as much as I could. <laughs> as soon as they said, oh, you're wrestling Brooksy, I was like, why? Oh, <laughs> uh, how, how am I going to survive this? But um, yeah, I mean, you know, in any, it, it was a very weird year last year and things just kind of felt like they did. So I was very lucky to get the opportunity to wrestle him and I learned a lot from that match. Um, Cree, I haven't had a chance to wrestle yet. So I'm really hoping that. Maddie as well. Um, I don't know if it would ever fall. I mean, Rocky and I had wrestled each other in, in the past. I don't know if that will ever happen again, but uh, you know, he's, he's got a very different, well, I suppose he, we would, you would say a different style, but I know he likes to slow it down. So I'd love to get in there with him <laughs> one day. Um, there's, I've been in there with Down Under, which was great. Kit Condor was my first match there. And as soon as I get in the ring with a guy who's going to do, I, I pride myself on being being able to take just about all of the ranas and head scissors you can do. Maybe not the real lucha ones where you're like flipping them around your shoulders 36 mm -hmm. times because now that I'm old, my shoulders and elbows and backs and like that sort of stuff. But, you know, getting in any guys like that where I know I can make them good, make them look good with that stuff is always good. So, I mean, I got in there with Andy Virus too, who's, you know, he's fairly new. Um, there, there's pr pretty much anyone that I haven't wrestled. There's no one at, say, Wright City that I'd go, oh, don't want to get in there with him um, because everyone's got such a great attitude and everything. Like, it's, like I said, everyone at Rampage, are, oh, apart from maybe some of the newer guys at Rampage, but, you know, I've been able to wrestle any of the sort of guys I've always wanted to wrestle there, which has been great. Anyone at at RCW, I can get in there with would be fantastic. ACW, um, I've wrestled a couple of guys there. I got to do a few matches with Duke Marshall, who was a newer guy there. And it was great to see him improve in every match that we had. Basically, anyone I haven't wrestled where I can, maybe they'll learn a little bit off me and I can learn something off them. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that with just about anyone, really. Yeah. And um, you mentioned before, like you, about making someone look good. Was there, was there a point in your, a noticeable point in your career where you decided, where, where there's something clicked where you're like, if I make them look as good as possible, then I don't really have to worry about looking good because I'm going to look good by, do you know well, what I mean? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, I, I always say, if you've got two guys who's, I mean, you know, you've got a story to tell and you've got certain things you need to do and hit. But if both guys are thinking, how can I make this guy look good? you know you're both going to come out looking great. Especially if you, you know, you don't have egos over certain bits and pieces. If, if it's just about, you know, we're here to put on a show and entertain people who've paid money. You've got the privilege of getting to go out there and do what you love, make each other look good, have fun. But I mean, you know, early on, it was all about how many big moves can we all hit in? But I suppose in a way that was about, I suppose it was less about making the opponent look good and I want to get all my moves in, but because you both wanted to get all your moves in, you both got to do them all. Whether or not that made you look good because the matches weren't told very well, different story. But, you know, like I can, I can remember multiple times over the years, Jag saying to me, you're letting them get too much stuff in. Um, that that's probably just something that, you know, I'm, I'm not the most athletic guy. I, I certainly am not the, I don't have the most charisma or any of those sorts of things, but I do feel like I can take a, you know, take a bunch of different moves and I can, I can look silly. I can look angry. I can look like I've stuffed up. I can, you know, whatever I need to, I can do all those different things and make someone look good. And if, you know, maybe my moves aren't the best, I'm not the best with the crowd, but at least I can make someone else look really good while I'm out there. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. Mm. Um, 
I want to thank you so much for, for coming on, mate. It's, it's you, you honestly, you've been one of my bucket list guys that I've wanted to talk to you for a while. And it's honestly, it just has been like getting the courage up <laughs> to, to message you. <laughs> but, um, it's all an act. It's just how I live. <laughs> uh, but do you think like going back just quickly, going back, do you think the one, one thing I, I don't think that a lot of guys realize is how lucky we all are to be doing this really mm. at the end like and i i've always had this like i constantly can't believe people want to pay money to see us go out there and do that yeah like yeah. constantly and and when i explained it to to my mates because like what the hell are you doing with this like it's fucking pro wrestling what are you doing i said well you play footy in the weekend yeah i said yes how many kids buy your t-shirts or want an autograph with you want a photo with you after the game like none i said we get that every show People buy DVDs yep. to watch what we did that night. This is a totally different. <laughs> it's like mm. it's 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 a, a mix between the two things I love is acting and 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 sport. And this to me yep. is the the perfect amalgamation of that. And I I think honestly, especially nowadays where we're like, well, it's not that hard to break in, whereas it used to be really hard <laughs> to break in. It's not that hard to break in, and I don't think unless you really worked for it that they realized how hard it is and how lucky we are mm. to be in front of the people that we get to be in front of all the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I noticed like it more a, with the break with the, the COVID break. I think that's when it yeah. really hit home to me, how lucky we are that we get to do it being that we didn't get to do it for yeah. a year. No, that's it. I mean, there's something special about professional wrestling. I mean, like I said, I'm generally a quiet kind of guy. Um, while I was, you know, okay athletically, I certainly didn't excel at any sports. Um, wrestling's been a great outlet for me, you know, gain more confidence, be in front of people, that sort of thing, which, you know, has never been a strong point of me personally. I've, I've got to go and do that real physical athletic side of things that, you know, in other competitive sports, I, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have really stood out at all. Um, and as an outlet, like to, you know, like we were talking before with COVID, how maybe our lives didn't really change that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that sort of thing. But, you know, it, it sort of gets me out there amongst people, which is good for you, which, you know, if, if, if I was left to my own devices, I'd probably never leave the house. So there, there's so many parts about professional wrestling, like whether you're introverted or extroverted, you, you can get something out of it. I, you know, as a more introverted person, I think it's good to have that exposure with people when I'm out there, I almost feel like I'm someone completely different and I get to be someone different than what I normally am from my everyday yeah. life. There's just so many parts of it. And yeah, people don't, some people don't realize the privilege it is that people are paying to come along and watch you do something you're doing because it's fun and you enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I, every show I'm at, I'll grumble in one form or another, like, oh, geez, I'm getting too old for this. My back's killing today, whatever. But like I said, you know, I'm here trying to enjoy it as, as much as I can before I have to stop because I know once it's gone, I'll miss it very much. Mm. Well, I know, like, because I know if it wasn't for wrestling, I wouldn't be doing this in any way, shape or form. Mm. And I've, this is something I've really grown to love. And I've realized just sort of recently that even when I decide I don't want to be like actually wrestling or be involved in wrestling anymore, I can still keep doing this as long as I have a voice. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? And so I can yep. still sort of like uh, in some way help the, the industry far past when I'm at shows or working shows. So yeah, that's, and it really has been like COVID has been the, the thing that really drove that home to me, like that I missed yeah. that, that connection with the crowd. With, with you, with, and I know I was going to wrap it up. I was just like, was, was COVID for you almost like a good chance to rest your body <laughs> for a couple of months? Well, it was, but Oh, I'm a very up and down person. Like, I, I can have like a great show, a great match. I feel fantastic about my wrestling and I'm like, yeah, look, I'm doing all right. And then it can be, you know, I have a bad day or whatever. It's a week later, I wake up, my back's hurting and I'm like, why am I still doing this for? Like, <laughs> I should just retire. So in, the, in that short, you know, Adelaide only had like a small sort of lockdown before we could start getting back to gym shows and stuff. It wasn't actually too bad here. Mm. During that period, I think I messaged a couple of people and said, oh, look, I'll probably wrap it up by the end of the year because having that break from it 
not being around the people, not, you know, it, it's very easy to forget the things that you love about something when you're not, <laughs> not yeah. actively doing it. So, so you, you know, it, once we got back into it, I was like, yeah, look, I've, I've missed this and I need to make, you know, again, I need to make the most of it while it, while it's still there. So it was a good reminder, especially once we got out of it and got back, if it had gone on for too long, I actually don't know how things would have gone, you know, that's just your mind playing tricks with you. But um, yeah, it was, it was a timely reminder that uh, it's a privilege to do it and make the most of it while you can. Well, mate, it has been, how's this for, for a segue? It's been a privilege to talk to you. <laughs> and um, thank you. Thank you for, very much. For, for people that are home that want to follow you, um, how can they do that on, on the socials and all that sort of jazz? So I, I have all those new fangled technology things. I think I've even got Twitter, but I, I don't know where that is. But I think it's, it's havoc underscore pro underscore wrestler on Instagram. And I'm pretty sure if you just search Havoc Pro Wrestler, just remember, it's with a K. Okay. I always get these jokes from everyone going, hey, it's Havoc with a C, isn't it? It's like, no, I came up with this when I was 19. Of course it's with a K. <laughs> so just look for Havoc Pro Wrestler on Instagram or Facebook, and I'm sure you'll find it. Now, you've got to be one of the only guys that has sort of like kept his name the whole way through. Because all the other guys I, I know guess, that, that I start guess I'm, have changed. I guess I'm just not that. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm just not that smart, am I? <laughs> oh no, I did have a little phase in there where I was. Uh, I think I was Bruce Mills for a while when I sort of went into my, you know, when everyone went through their tough guy real name oh. phase. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, why bother with that? Let's just stick with habit. Yeah, I never really got a choice. Cree was just like, this is your name. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> ah, sometimes that works out for the best though. Yeah, well, I know originally I wanted, because my dad's first name was Rex, I wanted my name to be Todd Rex, and then you could change it to mm. T-Rex T or anything like that. And I pitched it, I pitched it to Maddie, and Maddie's like, that's stupid. I'm like, well, okay, guess I'm not, guess I'm not doing that then. Yeah, the good, but that's a good thing about him. He'll just be nice, nice and blunt and honest to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, mate, thank you so much for coming on. Um, no, thanks for having me on. An absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, so hopefully I'll meet you in the flesh soon. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping they can get down Adelaide when the world gets back to normal. <laughs> yeah, could be a while. So hopefully I'm still around. Well, yeah. Well, I'll just message you. I'll <laughs> catch up yeah. with you. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, then you don't have to catch up with people in person. All the better. <laughs>
we wouldn't have, wouldn't have had the, the the run he had if it wasn't for that. So hell, I wouldn't be around because Matt and Cree wouldn't have been, done their thing. So like a massive thanks to those guys, a massive thanks to Cole Devani, who's someone that, that we don't get a chance to really talk about a hell of a lot, but he really did, really is like the godfather of South Australian wrestling. And um, for the stuff he done or did to, to make South Australian wrestling, well, to, to start it up from the ground up, a massive thanks to him. A massive thanks to Havoc for coming on the show. Uh, if you get a chance, go onto uh, YouTube, uh, go and look up Adam Brooks versus Havoc. I, I believe it's up there as a single match as a like a 12 day 12 days of christmas special that the rcw did on their youtube channel then the, the single match of those two jag and havoc were on uh, jag and havoc and adam brooks were on there go and check it out because it is a great match and um when you're watching you just think this guy's been doing it for over 20 years and he is well and truly keeping up with one of the best in the country currently and that is adam brooks uh if you haven't already though guys Please subscribe to Wrestle Radio Australia. You can do it on Apple Podcasts, uh, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcasts from around the country or vodcasts from around the country, around the world. Uh, you can do it for that. Uh, YouTube, please uh, subscribe to us so you catch every episode that comes up. Uh, if you do, follow us on Apple Podcasts, give us some rating and review, gets us inside more ears and spreads the word about the show around the country. Um, as always, support Australian wrestling in, in any way you can if that's going to to um, the fight app and, and paying and, and getting the any PCW shows that come up uh, the PWA shows that come up I know that for a fact that that uh, as of recording this uh, PWA it started with a kiss the the March 12th show is now sold out so the only way you'll be able to watch it live is by watching it on the fight app so get around it and support Australian professional wrestling. Uh, if, you, if you can't do that or you don't really want to do that, head on to, you saw the ad earlier in the show for Australian, uh, the Australian Wrestling Network. Get around them. Uh, so many professional wrestling promotions from around Australia that are on that network. So you can you go there and you can check them out as well. Uh, of course, Riot City Wrestling, where um, Havoc wrestles as well as Ref Rampage. Um, they have a YouTube channel, which has all their events on there. Please go and subscribe to that. Uh, PCW have a network. Go and check them out and see if, you, if, this is not, if you've got the money, please subscribe to it. Most of all, just, just support it. Any way you can support this professional wrestling in Australia because it is truly an art form that we love. We do love doing it for you every week, every fortnight, every month, every year. And we want to keep doing that. And the only way we can do that is by having your support. Uh, if you want to support the wrestlers themselves, please go to wrestlermerch.com. Uh, go and check them out. A lot of uh, professional wrestlers from around the country now have stores on that website. You can go there and check out and buy some of their merch and support the guys that, that are doing this, uh, sacrificing themselves, getting out there, going to the gym, going to training, doing all this stuff so they can perform and do their best for you people. So the least we can do is to buy a T-shirt and rep them. So please go and do that. Uh, there's no real way of supporting us here at Wrestle Radio Australia, except to go onto Redbubble, just type up Wrestle Radio Australia. Anything I get from the sale of t-shirts, coffee cups, anything that, that's on there, it's a whole plethora of things you can buy with uh, Wrestle Radio Australia on it. Any of the profits go from that go to Beyond Blue and Gotcha for Life, which are two um, charities that I really do support, uh, Men's Health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a lot of people don't know this well. And if you've been watching the show or listening to the show for a, a length of time, you will know that, that um, uh, we lost our co-host, Josh Armour, to men's health. And um, it is a epidemic and something that we really want to try and help stamp out. And if, if me donating just whatever we make off T-shirts and et cetera can go a little way to helping that, I'm more than welcome. I'm more than happy to do it. I don't really care about making any money from this show, to be perfectly honest. This show has been wholly and solely set up from day dot. Josh Armour and I both decided that, that all we wanted to do with this show is promote Australian wrestling as much as we can. And when we started this, I think it was eight years ago now, there were no streaming services. There were no, no fight apps. There were no... The only way you could see live Australian professional wrestling is to go and see it. And I'm so glad to see over these last eight years how much the industry's grown. And I cannot wait to see how much it's going to grow in the next eight. 
And with that, that is it for this week here at Wrestle Radio Australia. Uh, next week, it's going to be a bit of a different one. I'm interviewing a uh, comedian, Dan St. Germain, from, uh, he's an American comedian who has a podcast called Wrestle Roast. Um, so it's going to be pretty much predominantly talking about um, roast comedy, AEW, WWE, the American product a bit more because his American comedian doesn't really know much of the Australian product. Although I might ask him to see what he knows. He probably just knows Ray Ripley and the and Buddy Murphy and those guys. But we'll find out, I guess. That is next week, right here. Until then, that's my opinion. You're entitled to it. And we'll see you next week, right here, Wrestle Australia. It's been busy 23, coming feeling way too sweet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Too sweet, too sweet, put your fangs up. Too sweet, too sweet, pour another cup. Let's be prison 23.